the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. For most Cincinnatians, it's images of symphony concerts and May festivals that spring up when they think of Music Hall. Music Hall has been the center of Cincinnati's performing arts since it opened in 1877, but it has been much more than that, and over the years has been reconfigured many times to meet the evolving needs. But through all the adaptations, it endures as the place where most Cincinnatians are introduced to fine music on a grand scale. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers on the CW Cincinnati. This past week, a new organization, the Music Hall Revitalization Corporation, was unveiled. Many organizations closely tied to Music Hall already exist, including the Cincinnati Arts Association, which manages the hall along with the Aronoff Center. In addition, there are the Cincinnati Symphony and the Pops Orchestras, the May Festival, and the Cincinnati Ballet that all perform at Music Hall, and the Society for the Preservation of Music Hall that looks out for the hall and has promoted incremental improvements over the years. Over the past decade, a growing number of proposals to modify the hall have surfaced to address a variety of needs of the building and the constituent organizations. Although many people may think that the hall has always looked the way they experience it today, that could not be farther from the historic record. Designed to serve the region's exposition or convention center as well as a performing arts center, the original Central Hall had no stage and no fixed seats to accommodate regular industrial fairs, two national political conventions, and other functions. Once the symphony orchestra became the main tenant, a presidium stage and fixed seating made sense. To discuss the role of the new corporation and the future of Music Hall, I am joined this morning by Jack Rouse. Mr. Rouse is the retired co-founder and chairman of Jack Rouse Associates, Associates and has served on the boards of the Symphony 3CDC, which is developing the Over the Rhine, as well as the Playhouse and the Park, the Zoo, the Port Authority, you name it, he's been there. Jack. Too much information. Welcome back. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, Let's, uh, let's get started by why a new organization, since as I sort of tried to sketch out there, there's already a lot of individual organizations, not for private corporations, they're already committed and involved in Music Hall. Why another one? Sure, well, all the organizations, the anchor tenants, if you will, the opera, the symphony, the ballet, May Festival, certainly CAA and the society, all have ongoing work that they do. I think that the group decided that we needed a dedicated organization, a not-for-profit corporation, whose basic goal is to put itself out of business as quickly as possible because we get the job done. Uh, the focus is singularly on the revitalization of Music Hall. Uh, it also sort of takes it away from some of the proprietary interests of each of the various five or six organizations. And everybody, everybody agreed to it, that it, it was a damn smart thing to do to put this in the hands of an organization that was dedicated solely to getting this job done. What's this organization <clears throat> going, going to be? I mean, is it, it'll be a board. Who, who, what type, will there be representatives from these different constituent organizations? Sure, sure. Will there be a staff? What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about doing it as lean and efficient as we can. The board composition, and the corporation hasn't been formed yet. It'll either be uh, an LLC or a 501c3 or something like that. But the board is going to require certain skill sets, and whether that skill sets with concert presentation, theatrical presentation, government relations, uh, law, government, you name it. But we also must represent on the board the various constituent organizations. Within the boards of all those organizations, you're going to find those skill sets. As far as the staff is concerned, CAA is going to provide the staff in the, in the uh, first uh, phase as we select a di and design architect and then start to move forward. But, you know, it's, this feels very much, frankly, like where I was six years ago when we started 3CDC uh, and started looking around for Mr. Leeper, who obviously has been a huge success in town. Um, it's, got, it's an entrepreneurial board because we got one goal, to entrepreneurially revitalize, you know, one of the great treasures in town. Before we get off that structure, it's been reported that the president of the Music Hall Preservation Association, Norma Peterson, is being quoted as saying she didn't know this was coming, hadn't been consulted. 
is there tension here between preservation and revitalization? There's always tension between preservation and revitalization. In, in my working life, I've dealt with this every day almost. Uh, we met earlier this week with the leadership of, of the society. Norma was there. Uh, there will always be a healthy tension between, you know, honoring the past and creating amenities that uh, contemporary audiences want. But we had, a, we had a great meeting earlier this week, and, and next week I'll be at their full board meeting and uh, start to push this ball down the field. I, I think everybody's on the same page. Okay, you don't think that's an ongoing tension? Or it's not an ongoing problem? Tension is a different thing. No, you, it no, can't that, be creative. Yeah, there, there, there's a healthy tension. No, it's not an ongoing problem. You know, I'm far too old to deal with ongoing problems. I, I can manage ongoing tensions, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> what is needed? Why? Why is there a need to do something major at Music Hall? From an audience perspective, Music Hall doesn't work. There are all kinds of reasons. The audience amenities aren't there. The comfort what, is not what there. What does that mean, amenity, amenities? It means the ability to feel welcome, to have appropriate uh, refreshments, beverage, uh, warm experiences, conversation areas, exhibitions of the history of the organizations of the hall. I mean, the hall is, beautiful as it is, it's very neutral. You know, it, it, it's, there's nothing in there that screams this is our place. And I don't mean our, the symphony and the opera. I mean our, the folks who come here. I mean, I, I've said this and it's probably a trite as you can imagine, but it was the people's place at one time or the people's palace. You listed a group of things, you know, you forgot wrestling and roller derbies and all the other things. And that's what we want to do. We want to swing open the doors. And it's not just a question of revitalizing the hall. Uh, the tenant organizations are revitalizing their program to meet contemporary audiences. You know as well as I what's happening to classical music, classical opera, classical ballet. It's not an upward trend. This is one piece of reversing that trend. And so creating a place that's more warm, more friendly, more welcome with the amenities that audiences require. I wrote a design brief a couple weeks ago on this, and it's, it's totally audience focused. Yes, of course, we need to deal with what the opera needs, the symphony needs, and the ballet needs. Put that aside. The audience doesn't care about that as much as the that audience. That can be backstage stuff. It's that backstage. Do be... you think the average person cares how many flying sets there are? Of course not. Now, you've got to deal with it. Right. That's important. But more importantly, you've got to make it a place as it was in 1878. You know, you all come in. And happily, this is happening at the same time that, Washington, or that uh, Over the Rhine is going through an amazing transformation. So they really do, the context in which Music Hall lives is so important to the success going forward. We would not have been having this conversation 10 years ago. Because? Because nobody thought anyone ever wanted to go to Over the Rhine again. I see, okay. Have you been to 12th Street lately? And have Vine? I? Personally, yes, but. To the Senate bar? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you sit there today and you say, five years ago, we wouldn't have been sitting there. Mm -hmm. There's no chance we would have driven through there if we didn't have to. It's an amazing transformation. And the plans for Washington Park, I mean, it's all part of the same cool thing. So it, it's easy to get pretty fired up about this. <coughs> and <laughs> we will just say, you have a cough and thank you. For that's, it. that's perfectly obvious, but yes. Thank yeah, you. we'll work with that. Okay. Um, on these amenities <clears throat> questions, I mean, we think about this sometimes with sports stadiums. Those get talked about a lot. Sure. Are there things like private boxes, which work so well in sports stadiums? I mean, there are boxes at Music, uh, Hall. Music Hall, but I don't think they work the same way. Are we talking about some of that kind of thing, too? I, again, it's too early because we are just in the process of recruiting a design architect. There hasn't been much talk yet about premium seating or boxes, but I will tell you, Every cultural organization in the country is trying to figure out what is the best way to unlock some of the revenue that traditionally they, that they have not tapped. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the lessons, though, from the sports world, too, is that the halls of fames, the museums that are such an integral part now of most stadiums, both in Major League Baseball and the NFL, you know, why aren't we honoring the tenant organ? There's a history here that you wouldn't believe for the right. symphony. And yet, when you go into Music Hall today, you aren't sure that whose home it really is. It's just a nice auditorium. Mm -hmm. We got to change that. The um, one of the issues that's been talked about 
that's reached out to the public is that maybe the hall is simply too big that there are too many seats that there's a sense that people get scattered and there's a sense that even though there's a lot of people there you feel like when you're there sometimes there aren't many people there because it, you, you see empty seats rather than all the filled seats is that still on the table is it cutting the number of seats here absolutely I, I think that you know if in concert halls around the world, this is the largest, you know, and if it's not the largest, it's one of the top three largest. Um, it has no sense of intimacy. From an acoustical standpoint, the audience lives in one acoustical space and the orchestra straddles two acoustical spaces. You have quite a few obstructed seats for orchestra and for May Festival and for opera. So the desire to create something where the audience is more in contact with the performance is what's driving all of that. It's not just eliminating seats for the purpose of eliminating seats. It's eliminating seats in order to get better seats, and again, here we go, provide a better audience experience, greater comfort. But yes, the seat count will go down. But that's changeable. It'll be a little different for opera than it is for symphony. Okay. Are There's there, some flexibility there. In the profession, are there targets for that? You know, in terms what, of the number? Yeah, in terms of, for a symphony orchestra, it's best if they're playing to a house that has X number of people. A few and, thousand for a symphony. Not 30 some odd hundred. Okay. You know. um, what about opera? It depends on the configuration. If, if you have the wraparound with a lot of block seats, <laughs> these guys over here on the side who get a great view of stage right wings, but maybe right. not a great view of the stage, the numbers don't matter as much as the sight lines. And uh, the configuration. And the so. configuration. Yeah. So, in that sense, similar to a smaller baseball park. So that Ab absolutely. So that the yep. when you go to the Red Stadium, Great American Ballpark, you can see the game better. Again, driven by the audience experience. You're going to get bored with that term before this is over. Uh, I already no. <laughs> I, uh, but the uh, the we're talking. I know still in the early stages of this. There's been some numbers thrown around. Mm, what do you think this is going to cost? What, what ballpark are we talking about? The number about? that is out there right now, based on early, early concept, is $92 million. Um, there's a healthy contingency in there, so the actual construction cost may be in the 70s somewhere. But again, until you get a little farther on in the design process, you don't know. Remember, we're dealing with a building that not only was built many years ago, but it's been remodeled many times. Right. And as good as the team, uh, GBBN and Messer and others have been in terms of sort of creating as built, you never know what's behind that wall until you start taking the wall down. I mean, the opera went through this when they remodeled their offices. There, there's a lot of oopses when you deal with remodeling in a historic building. No, yeah, there's a, uh, gee, there's a pipe hey, back there. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't know that. Uh, yeah, the drawings don't exist. Uh, no, no, In no, the no, same they, way that they we They didn't leave a lot of as built from right, those days. Right, right. Um, so you've been involved, I think most recently, I think about the Playhouse. There were some grand plans to um, move the Playhouse downtown, and let's face it, we ran into an economic downturn that has... <laughs> That's mild. That, yes. that has scuttled a lot of things. Picking this one up at this point, does this feel like the right time to be trying to make this one move? Let me go back to the Playhouse. One of the primary goals of that was to get several organizations to come together into a complex. That plan was the Playhouse, the Opera, part-time when they were in Music Hall, the Ballet, and the Children's Theater. The sense of all of that was the collaboration among the groups. Fast forward. We have that collaboration among the groups in Music Hall, and we have a building, and we have a need to revitalize. Would I have rather done this, or would anyone have rather done this several years ago, you know, when the market was going up, up, up? Sure, but look, that's the hand we're dealt, and we can't wait uh, until better times come uh, to, to start on it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. The real goal, though, is that we've got art groups coming together and cooperating for a greater community good. You know, there's the financial side and just the construction side and all that. There's some very practical implementation questions here that when the construction starts, <laughs> construction of yeah. this magnitude is going to shut down the performance space for a significant period of time, which means all of these <clears throat> organizations have to find other places to be. Uh, that's a big management problem. And that, does that fall into your bailiwick too? 
Well, only in so far as any the project schedule must reflect where the orchestra, the May Festival, opera, ballet is performing during that period. The construction schedule is projected to be 18 months. That's a full symphony season and two opera seasons. Um, obviously, because of the nature of the schedules of the groups, you can't slide that just a month one way or another. So, you know, if any changes in the schedule, you're really talking about but year changes. The groups have already started talking about where they would go and, and where they would play during that period. I mean, that's really more of an operational issue that, you know, Trey and Patty Beggs and... And, the, you know, about. we have the Aronoff, thank goodness. Yeah, and, and, and some of these events will happen there. But if you put too many there, <clears throat> then you squeeze out some of the Broadway series. So financially, there's no simple thing here. Um, mm, it's not simple. I, I will say, though, I, there's something to be said for getting the orchestra the ballet and the opera out into the community to whet their appetites, if you will. I mean, the symphony's done this, the ballet's done it, the opera's done it. Uh, here's, that's not all bad. Here's the other danger, and I could imagine in that, a lot of the season ticket holders who also love Music Hall, do you take a risk of never getting them back even after you've done all the work? It re having to rebuild your audience and your support base. Sure. I mean, we are rebuilding the audience and the support base anyway, regardless, no what. because, you know, season tickets are declining everywhere, all over the world. Right. Uh, the aging audience, which of course I'm in, obviously, you know, is aging, exiting mm -hmm. stage left soon uh, or eventually. Uh, and so we have to rebuild that audience anyway. Uh, that's always thrown up as a concern quick story. Years ago, the famous Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis announced they were going to change their location from where, <coughs> I'm sorry, <clears throat> from where Tyrone had originally envisioned it. And there was everything but burning the artistic director in effigy when they said, that, and we're never going to subscribe again and we're never coming back. Right after the move, they've had the largest subscription seasons they've ever had and it continues to grow. There's a fear of change, there always is, and Cincinnati is no different than any other town. But our goal is to make sure that when everybody comes back, they say, wow, why didn't we do this earlier, maybe? Because mm -hmm. you know, when Music Hall opened, it was a wow. It's oh, a bit tired now. It was an incredible wow, and we forget that it was not only a wow locally, it was a wow nationally. That's why those national political conventions yep. came here. Yep. This was the exposition 19th century word for convention, center of the United States for a period of right. time. And I think the other piece of that, that all of us collectively have not done a good job on, is communicating to the public that it's not just the symphony, the opera, and the ballet, and the May Festival. There's still a heck of a lot of stuff that goes on there. I mean, graduations go on right. there, weddings go on there, pop concerts go on there, rock concerts. Garrison Keillor brought Prairie Home Companion last year. Um, we've got to fling open the doors and get the word out that there's a lot of cool stuff going on in Music Hall. Okay, and we're going to watch this over the next few years very closely. You'll be back because you're so easy to talk to. Talk to you later. Okay, stay tuned. After the break, a special report on the latest developments in the story that Jeff Hirsch has been following in Union Township. Welcome back. Over the past eight months, Local 12 reporter Jeff Hirsch has prepared several investigative reports for newsmakers on developments in Union Township, Claremont County. This report is triggered by the recent decision of the Township trustees to rehire Ken Geis as the Township Administrator. Geis will replace David Duckworth, who was fired earlier this month after 10 months on the job. Geis worked as the administrator for nearly 12 years before going to work for the developer of the Ivy Point Commerce Park in the township. Here is Jeff Hirsch's report on the latest development. This is a double dip. And this man is about to double dip as well. Ken Geis, the former and now future administrator of Union Township. Township trustees are about to rehire Geis, likely pay him more than $100,000 a year, on top of a more than $300,000 going away present, a pension bump Geis received from the taxpayers when he retired in 2006. Salary and pension at the same time, double dip. Well, am I shocked? 
No. Am I mystified? Yes. In January 06, Geis signed a lucrative contract with the township. In addition to his salary, the trustees agreed, as they had for a decade, to buy extra retirement time. In other words, boost Geis' pension when he left. And just a few weeks after getting that contract, Geis did indeed hand in his retirement and went to work for a company he knew quite well. Cincinnati United Contractors. Before leaving the township, Geis and CUC put together an office park development called Ivy Point, which would ultimately cost the township nearly $6 million for land. One big question is about Ivy Point. What was the whole deal with Ivy Point? Setting that up, then leaving the township and go work for the company that you set the deal up with. So far, Ivy Point is just a couple of buildings, vacant property, and a little used park. But trustees want Ken Geis back. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The January 14th trustees meeting started like any other, and Administrator David Duckworth, on the job for less than 10 months after leaving his old position of two decades as administrator in Miami Township, expected business as usual. And starting next month, I will start. Uh, I will prepare a, uh, for the board a budget analysis to show you where we are with respect to targets. It turned out Duckworth was the target instead, fired by the trustees with no like warning whatsoever. Motion. I'd like to move to terminate the contract with Township Administrator Mr. David Duckworth without And with no search, no checking for other candidates, decided to bring back four, Ken Geis. Mr. Geis came in and left through a back door of the Township uh, Civic Center. John McGraw ran unsuccessfully for township trustee last November. I think it's good uh, human resource practice to advertise a job, get a pool of candidates, and find the best candidate. I don't think you can just hire one without interviewing other people. The fix was in. Yes. I'm not uh, big on doing things for show. Trustees Chair Tim Donlan says he first asked guys to come back a year ago. Guys said no then, yes now. As for a search. It would have been nothing more than a charade to interview 20 other people when in fact I knew who, who I wanted to hire. I'm not big on charades and had no intention of doing that. Donlan says things with Dave Duckworth were not working out. Uh, the, he would have uh, been asked to move on at some point regardless of Mr. Geis's availability. Critics don't buy that. I don't think uh, there's anyone who could argue uh, that David Duckworth is a highly respected, um, very effective administrator, and he's demonstrated that, you know, within the confines of Claremont County and Miami Township. Uh, to bring him on board uh, for the length of time that they did, uh, and then cut him loose, again, is just mystifying. Actually, Ken Geis got more than just a generous retirement present from the taxpayers. He also was able to cash in $41,000 in unused sick time, making his total payout $360,000. And get this, Union Township taxpayers are also forking over $206,000 to former Administrator Doug Walker, who was fired in 2008 amidst a state finance and ethics investigation. Walker, a trustee who voted for Ken Geis's lucrative contract, got one himself when he became administrator after Geis left. A fat payout if Walker was fired for any reason. And there's more. May we have a motion to adjourn, gentlemen? The township is also paying Duckworth $36,000 in severance for firing him. Add it all up, Geis, Walker, and Duckworth are getting nearly $600,000 for either getting fired or getting a sweetheart retirement deal from the trustees. Well, the proof's in the pudding. I think uh, I couldn't uh, I couldn't argue uh, any point uh, where it might appear that their actions are in the best interest of the taxpayers, but I can certainly see where they might be in the best interest of their friends. Keep in mind, this is the same township which, back in November, had to beg residents to approve a tax increase to prevent the layoff of police officers and firefighters. $600,000 could certainly pay for some firefighters and cops, or it could buy each township resident a whole bunch of double dips. Jeff Hirsch, Local 12. Trustees scheduled a March 10th hearing to give public comment on their decision. Geis will then likely begin work within a month of the hearing. On another topic, 
Several weeks ago, I devoted an entire newsmakers to the exhibit Without Sanctuary, lynching photography in America, now at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. I have seen the exhibit four times in other uh, cities. This past week I visited the exhibit at the Freedom Center. I want to report that this is the best presentation of the powerful image that I have ever seen. This is not an easy exhibit, this is not uplifting, but anyone who cares about understanding America owes it to themselves to see this exhibit. This is the most important history exhibit ever to be displayed in Greater Cincinnati in my lifetime. Without Sanctuary continues at the Freedom Center through May 31st. You may view Newsmakers program that we did on the exhibit in, on the January 10th, local12.com. Have a good week.